David Bohm Seminars Series 1, Sunday morning, November 5th, 1989, Session 2, Oak Grove School, Ojai, California. Well, I think you can see that in some sense we become addicted to thoughts. Some chemical change occurs in certain thoughts, right, which makes adds to the problem, right? Uh, and other physical chemical changes may occur when we think in certain ways which make it more difficult to get out of it. Like, for example, the nerves make it hooked up permanently in a certain way and you find it very hard to change, right? Or there was an article some time ago in the New York Times uh, saying, you see, this normal process that I suggested of where the intellectual function reviews the emotions and sees whether they're appropriate or not and says if they're not appropriate, stop it, right? That can, there's another process which uh, may interfere with that. Uh, the, there seems to be at the base of the brain the possibility of a very fast emotional reaction that mobilizes the whole system so fast that the intellectual function has no way to get in there and, and see whether and, and, and uh, decide whether it's appropriate or not, right? And so this uh, had a survival value in early times because if if there were some sudden danger which you could recognize, say you knew about it, this might mobilize you very fast, right? If you waited until the intellect would come in and say this is the right, the right emotion, <laughs> it would be already lose precious time, right? <laughs> so uh, the uh, now this, on the other hand, this can be dangerous because a traumatic experience may le may produce that fast emotional reaction and it goes on to the memory. And then when you see something similar, it happens again. <laughs> too fast for the uh, for a reason to come in and say this is not appropriate, right? Hmm? So a reason comes in and may say it's not appropriate, but it doesn't work, and even so, a reason gets distorted. The pressure is to find reasons that justify it, right? Hmm? So the, the emotion and the intellect work together like that. Now, that very fast thing might also be very useful in other ways. Perhaps in a moment of insight there is a, such a fast reaction, too fast for thought, to wipe away the cobwebs of memory, you see, <laughs> right? In other words, uh, uh, ordinarily it's very hard for us to change thought because as we try to change it by thought, we don't get it all. It's still changing <laughs> and we never catch up, right? <laughs> That's clear, isn't it? So, but there might be a very fast insight which can produce a, a feeling, a sudden feeling that is very fast and gets the thought and wipes it out like uh, burning out a cobweb, you see. See, these thoughts should be thought of as very insubstantial. They're like much less substantial than cobwebs. They're somewhere in the memory, you see. <laughs> and something could just wipe them out, you see. Hmm? Uh, a, a very fast insight or something suddenly happens. People have experienced that, where fear vanishes, right? <laughs> or, and so on. Hmm? Uh, now, uh, so... Uh, the thing is complex, and we have to consider all that. Uh, and the uh, and and uh, uh, the uh, that it, that uh, persistent uh, results of certain lines of thought can begin to change the way the brain is hooked up, or the way it works chemically. <laughs> And new connection connections are made very firm, and many other things may happen, so that uh, it's not simply a question of thought anymore. But still, there may be an insight that can get to it. You see, as Krishnamurti has said, insight can change the brain cells. Now, in fact, even thought changes the brain cells. It's changing it all the time. You see, it changes the flow of blood. It changes the way chemicals work. Uh, every thought changes the brain cells, but not necessarily in a very coherent way. Now, there might be an insight of the whole which could change the brain cells coherently and wipe out whatever it is that's not that's incoherent while leaving what is necessary. Right? Uh, so, uh, uh, the uh, uh, now, but that insight will occur at a level which we experience as subtle, you see, I say, which we experience as concrete and subtle. You see that it's it's like the this bicycle riding, but even more subtle. You see, uh, 
Now, the talking about it will help bring it out. Also, it's necessary to become aware that thought is doing all this. You see, by directly seeing it, right? Is that clear what I'm saying? Uh, now, there could be an insight at a more subtle level still. The mind may perhaps have infinitely subtle levels, uh, potentially open, accessible, available. And maybe intelligence is that possibility of unlimited subtlety. Uh, that as long as it's limited subtlety, then it's mechanical, you see. You could say it's subtle, but it's fixed right there, and then it becomes mechanical. Now, But that, that mechanical thing may now be incoherent when you extend it too far, and there's something still more subtle that could see that, right? Hmm. Now, therefore, ultimately, it has no fixity. It's creative, you see. That the new perception is creative. Let me try to put it that way. Uh, the... Uh, uh, there are various ways of looking at perception. The one way which modern science is tending to put forth is that the brain is a complex mechanism which sort of constructs our experience of reality, the whole picture, the feeling, and all that, right? You can see that illusions are created when the brain isn't working right, which back that up. You see, if certain things are wrong with the brain, you get a, a different uh, experience of reality which may not be appropriate. And, um, and so on. Now, uh, then we could say, given that whole picture of reality, the whole system is watching that picture to know what to do, right? <laughs> Every reaction is affected by that picture. <laughs> the meaning, that picture we'll call the whole meaning. And that is affecting everything, right? According to what's there, everything happens, right? <laughs> that helps to organize it all, you see, so that it might have been just a bunch of different modules or functions of various kinds, but they get organized in, if it's working right into a whole, right? Mm. Uh, which is has a physical basis, of, which is very, infant, very, very subtle. Huh? Mm. Uh, now, uh, as well as mental, you see. Now, the uh, uh, so uh, you can look at it that way, saying that the way you think affects that way that consciousness is created, right? Mm. Now, therefore, thought is participatory, right? Right? Uh, it, it participates in creating consciousness. It also participates in creating everything else that we see, right? Now, primitive peoples knew that thought was participatory. At least they realized that they had a very participatory kind of thought. They thought, for example, that they and the totem were participating together, the totem animal in the whole, or else even that there was a spirit of the whole in which everything was participating. You see that the word participate means partake of, like you partake of food together and also take part in producing that food. <laughs> so these are the two meanings. Now, uh, the, uh, so now the trouble is that gradually there developed from this participatory thought where everything was seen and experienced as together, right? Hmm? Not really divided. It developed into literal thought, where the thought claimed to tell you literally what everything is. Right? And that literal thought claimed not to be participating. It claimed to be just telling you what everything is. Now, certainly literal thought is necessary in many places, but there's a, a kind of mistake that it crept into it, right? which may not have been important when you think about the table, but... It becomes important when you think about yourself, right? Or about your own thought, or about society, or other people. Hmm? Would it be correct to say that the tree is part of my body? We said yesterday there's a way of saying that that's true, that all matter is interrelated in one, ultimately. But we can say on one level it's correct to think it's not. We can represent it as separate for certain purposes, but ultimately the representing it all together is necessary, right? Even according to physics, right? It all merges, right? Hmm? In fields of various kinds. Hmm? Now, another question is whether our minds are all one or separate. You see, if we think they are separate, we're going to experience them as separate, and that will make them separate. Now, we have to ask, well, if we think of them as not separate, will, will this change it? Well, we, this is an experiment. We, don't, we mustn't make up our minds beforehand, right? Hmm? But your mind has to be open, right? Okay, so now thought is participatory, but it claims not to be participatory. 
We discussed that last year. <coughs> uh, now, we have thought which openly admits participation, but even primitive peoples didn't probably fully realize that thought was participating in making consciousness. <laughs> right? They didn't even think of consciousness, you see. They probably they were, That's a new word. They were probably only thinking of uh, things that they were conscious of, right? Hmm? Or the world that they were conscious of. Hmm? So, so, David, is consciousness, is all it is, collective thought? Is that all? Well, no, we're trying to say it, in, it has collective thought, but I say consciousness is produced by the whole operation of, the, of the, everything, the brain, the senses and everything, and also the, all the thought and all the insight and everything. You see, it, it, right? Now, th- consciousness is this whole net picture, this whole net meaning. Right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, everything responds to that meaning. So consciousness, on one hand, looks very, very insubstantial and nothing. On the other hand, it is extremely powerful. And concrete. Mm. Right? Now, uh, when Krishna maybe says empty the consciousness, he's, he's, he means everything, the meaning leaves. Well, yes, the, all the meanings of thought and so on. The, the, see, most of our meanings are due to the memory, and those, and also they're, most of them are collective, and, and the uh, now that con- the, all that memory acts like a program to fill consciousness, right? But it, the memory contains the thought that it is not doing anything at all. See, that's the mistake, right? Right? Is that clear? Now that means that is why we find it so hard to get into this because we are already very thoroughly affected by the thought that thought is doing nothing at all except telling you the way things are. Now, you see, the, the FBI used to say, we do nothing except give information as to how things are, you see. <laughs> so, uh, but that information was enough to change things, right? Hmm? So, <clears throat> the, uh, the information is participatory. Hmm? So, the, uh, uh, now, <clears throat> uh, and all information is participatory, you see. But there is some information that's sufficiently not participatory, so that in a certain context, so we can call it uh, literal, and just just simply a representation of things as they are. Right? <laughs> now, but in general, information participates as well as being an abstraction, and it affects things concretely. Right? Hmm. Now. But the mistake of thought is it says it's not doing it. That's related. It's essentially the same mistake I said before. The thought does things and says it didn't do it and then tries to correct it. Now, the root of that is thought says I'm doing nothing but telling you how things are. <laughs> See, it follows from that, right? Therefore, if anything is out there, it cannot be due to the thought. <laughs> right? It must be due to that, something else. Hmm? The observer and the observer. Yeah, the this is the root of the observer and the observed problem, you see. That thought is the observer. <clears throat> is that clear? Sitting back and just watching the parade go by. Well, thought is the observer. You see, what does the observe, word observe mean? Now, there's an interesting clue to that in the Latin word for observe. One of the Latin words for observe is to gather with the eye. <coughs> right? And, uh, and to listen is to gather with the ear. You see, everything is all apart, you see. Now, you gather a certain amount of that together, which you're going to look at, okay, right? And then, having gathered together with your eye or your ear or whatever, you then f- find out what does it mean, right? That, that puts it all together. <laughs> if we don't know what it means, it's just a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, the idea is that when you gather with the eye, you just don't gather a lot of different bits and leave them there, but rather they, are, they come together in some meaning, right? <laughs> which may come from the past or may come from insight or whatever. Uh, now, so we say, in fact, thought is, plays a big role in the, in, in the observing function. It, it's gathered according to how thought says it's important and what's worth gathering and how they're to be related and so on. And, and also the meaning with which they're going to be put together often comes from memory, right? So therefore we could say memory becomes the observer. <laughs> Thought becomes the observer. Now, there's also an observation that's beyond thought, right? If everything was not, nothing but thought, we, we could never know and learn anything, right? <laughs> you see, because we could say, you can close your eyes and then tell me what's in the room, but meanwhile, it may change, right? 
unless your eyes are open, you can't see that. Hmm? So you're getting some information beyond memory. Hmm? Also, even inside, you can get some information beyond memory. You could say, I feel that my thought is incoherent, right? Uh, if that's a correct feeling, it cannot come only from memory because, you see, memory cannot just be conditioned to say that certain memories are coherent and certain ones are not, right? It's got to be something beyond or else it won't mean anything, right? Hmm? You, you'll get stuck if you say all your tests for what is coherent come from memory because you'll get to a st situation where your tests no longer apply, you see. that You need some fresh perception besides memory. Hmm? between what is a fresh perception and what is just uh, a thought being very sly. Yeah, well, that's very difficult. See, that's just what we're trying to get into. It's, it often, they look very similar, and we need to be extremely sensitive to see that there really is a difference. I mean, in some cases, it's obvious that if you close your eyes, that's memory you're seeing. You can imagine the room as you close your eyes. That's memory, right? That's fairly obvious. How do you know that, right? Well, you can know it in many ways. Huh? Now, in other cases, it could be very difficult. But then I'm saying that that requires greater subtlety and sensitivity to see it. But it's important to see that, that there is a distinction, you see. Now, so I'm saying, okay, there's thought, there's memory, there's observation can take place from memory if we say observation is basically gathering with the eye, with the ear, with the mind, right? Hmm? Is that clear? Yeah, the sense is just all of the senses. The senses help, but I'm saying all the senses. I gather with the eye, the ear, or any other sense, right? A touch. I gather it all together and then put it all together with the mind. I gather it all with the mind and pay attention to it, and then it, it, organizes. it organizes it into one meaning, right? happens simultaneously, will it have more relevance? Well, I don't know. You see, a lot of things we've got to gather gradually. Now, we may then suddenly see the meaning of it. See, with the senses, we can't get it all at once. It takes time. Hmm. Would you be practical at this point to distinguish between information and meaning? Information is only a limited kind of meaning, you see. It's, it's very limited. You see, uh, uh, it, it puts the word inform, it means to put form into, right? And you have a certain form which has a certain meaning, right? You see, like the letters of, which are printed constitute information, but unless the brain were ready with the meaning, it wouldn't be information, right? <laughs> now, the meaning is predicated, though, on your cultural background, your conditioning. Yes, and also on something beyond that, right? But information was a big way to do in the laboratory to distinguish between the different, the threshold of difference. Well, that gives rise to information, but it requires a perception, you see, to make that distinction, right? If you close your eyes, you know, you won't get it. And you see, uh, you, you, have to, you have to be informed beforehand what you should look for, because, you know, the laboratory is full of things. And you might be, you know, you go into the laboratory and say, well, I'll look at this, but it may not be relevant, right? I mean, they have to tell you what is, or else you'll build it yourself, and you know what is right to look at, right? Hmm. There are some things that are not, you don't need to look at it, and some things that you do, right? They can't look at everything, right? You see, so the, uh, it all depends on all that. Now, uh, so th there's a kind of intelligence required, which is a kind of, which comes from something more subtle than the particular levels of information. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, now, so we have observation. Now, the thing to notice is, which is very different from our traditional culture, that thought or memory response can observe. Right? We usually say, it is I who observe, <laughs> right? or you, right? or somebody. Hmm? Now, I've just said something quite different, right? which seems reasonable, what I've said, that memory observes, thought observes, not always, but at least to some extent, and sometimes, many times. Huh? Hmm? Now, but thought thinks, thought is programmed to think that there is a being who observes. <laughs> and the observation cannot take place unless there is a being who observes. <clears throat> but that's an abstraction. That yeah, it's an promise. idea, an abstraction of some sort, but we don't see it as an idea or an abstraction. We experience it as reality. You see, remember, ideas and thoughts and abstractions can be experienced as concrete realities, right? Sometimes the observer gets kind of dissolved in that observation. What? 
the observer gets kind of dissolved in that observation. He may get dissolved, but I think the other, he may lose, you may, you see, we may say that there can be, an, have you ever experienced an observation without the sense of a being who is observing? That's what I mean, that sometimes I, sometimes I believe the meaning that right. I have to remember that there's no observation without my presence. Yeah. Many of us, or all of us perhaps, may have experienced that from time to time, but most of the time it's the other way, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that automatically that brings the fact of being observed. If I am observing, automatically I feel that these people observe. Yeah, but we've used the words I am observing, which is an assumption that I am there first before. You see, <clears throat> let's look at, here are two assumptions I'm going to make in thought, right? One assumption is if there, I am there first and I decide I'm going to observe and then I observe, right? The other assumption is thought operates first, it observes, and then it says I am here doing the observing. <laughs> is it clear? Two different assumptions. Hmm? Does the thought have to be empty? I mean, it can't be a full thought when it's observing. I mean, the thought is coming from sense. memory. It's based on memory. Thought means the past, right? So the past is observing. The past is present. You see, I call it the past, but it's really there. You see, if you have a if you have a tape recording of what happened last year, you can say that's the past. The content is the past, but the tape recorder is right here. Right? <laughs> uh, so uh, the uh, uh, the same thing. I remember the past. The content is gone. The past, but the memory is right here. It's very subtle. I don't know what its concrete reality is, but it's there somewhere in me, <laughs> right? And the uh, and then. That memory acts. It, it suddenly springs into action and produces nervous reaction chemicals and body and I- images. Right? It, 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 what? Yeah, and, but not only reacts, but it reacts to the sensations are coming from out and it organizes them into a meaning. Is it usually referring to the past at the moment it's doing No, it, it doesn't know about the past. It says that's all present now, but it, it's the past acting, you see. <laughs> it's unaware that that's happening. Yes, the thought is unaware of itself altogether. It's, it's like an, any more than the computer. You see, thought, your computer is not aware of what it's doing. You see, nor is thought, because thought is the recording of the past, which is mechanical, and there's no reason why it should be aware of what it's doing, right? You see, uh, now, uh, it just does, right? <laughs> why? It's just operating. Yeah, just, just like your liver is operating, you see, and so is your thought, right? Uh, <laughs> Of your liver operating or your no, breathing? No, no, breathing? no you, you can be aware of breathing because that uh, can be both voluntary and involuntary function, but your liver, very few, if any, have made that a voluntary function. <laughs> 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 I mean, some of the yogis, yogis, yeah. can, uh, 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 yogis can make some functions voluntary that are involuntary, but there's a limit to that, right? <clears throat> now, the, uh, uh, so uh, when you know you've done it, when you've done it because it was your intention and your impulse, to it, and then you know it was voluntary, right? But it happens, you see, the trouble is that thought thinks it is a voluntary function. <laughs> As thought is programmed to think that it is a voluntary function, you see. So, <laughs> but it can't be voluntary unless there's somebody there who would do the willing, right? Who would be, <laughs> you see. So there might be a thought, the first moment in which you think of something, maybe in the most immediate thought, there is no sense of an observer. There is only the thing you're thinking about, right? Hmm? Right? Then, at the next moment, for some reason, which we'll try to find out, <laughs> there is another thought, which you don't, don't also observe, which says, it is I who am having this thought, right? Now, the meaning of that thought is that the thought is one thing and I am another. So that is the way, that is projected in, or the better word would be introjected into experience, right? Hmm. And, you, and, then, and, the, and then it's experienced that way. Hmm. So therefore, it's like the television set. You see, if you hear a bell ringing and you see a telephone there, you experience the sound is coming from a telephone. There is no telephone there, <laughs> but that's the way you experience it, right? <laughs> and then if it, nobody gets up to answer the phone, you would say, this can't be right, there's an incoherence. <laughs> and then it says, what does it mean, right? So you say, it may mean that my telephone bell in the other room is ringing, right? Hmm. And you go there, and maybe it is, right? So, but you can see that the experience is according to what it means. Huh? Hmm? You can experience something that is not there simply by saying that's what it means, huh? or by thought automatically doing it. Hmm? See, the fact that you experience something as there doesn't mean that it is there. Hmm? 
So when you say look inward, you may what you what you see may not be there at all. <laughs> hmm? You know, it may be just a fiction cooked up by in the memory, right? So how can you differentiate? Well, we're not we're trying I say I think that if we try to put that question first, we are going to be stuck. So we're trying to say going into it further and further, maybe we will find out we will begin to see what's involved, right? Hmm? See, it's important which question you put, where the order you put them in, and so on. Hmm. So, uh, see, that question at this, and I'm not, uh, you know, it's not personal or anything, that's just that the, that side of question is very interesting. Coming in that point will serve, will make a block, right? Because you'll say, how, how can you tell? You can't. <laughs> so you were stuck, right? <laughs> so let's say, okay, if we can't do that, let's see what else we can do. <laughs> Right uh, now, uh, the uh, 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 so uh, we say okay. Where were we now? Yeah, just saying. because you experience it, it doesn't mean it's there. <laughs> uh, so you experience yourself as there. It doesn't mean it's there independently of thought. Right? It's there in some sense, but it doesn't mean it's there in the way you think it's there. Right? Hmm? Even the telephone bell and the television set is there in some sense. It's in the spe- it's being put out by the speaker, you see. <laughs> but it's not coming from the telephone in the image, right? <laughs> Even though that's how you experience it. Hmm? Right? Hmm? So uh, the uh, therefore you may say you experience thought going on, and you experience yourself as the source of that thought. That doesn't mean that you, yourself is the source of that thought. It may or may not be. It doesn't follow necessarily, right? Hmm? It doesn't. The possibility of having a self may depend on having thought first. Hmm? Yeah. You see, the self is identified by thought, right? Saying this is me with such and such, this and that. You know, I belong here, there, and I'm this way and that way. And I, I am located inside this body, and you are located inside that body, and so on. You see, that's all thought, right? Now, now we all experience it that way. It doesn't prove that is the way it is. Hmm? It may be the way it is, but it doesn't prove it is that it is, right? David, you mentioned last year, and I had read it also about someone who had some brain damage, and they couldn't. Their memory was affected, and they would forget things from minute to minute. Did that person's identity remain the same, or did they not know who they were? Well, you see, the identity goes further. It's not merely, there are all kinds of memory. For example, that person was able, was a musician, and he was able to remember music very well. You see, so the damage was in the left brain and not in the right brain, right? So the, the memories of the right brain were seriously damaged, and the memories of the left brain were more or less all right. So once he started playing music, he could remember a lot of other things, you know, and in fact, he was able by, whether it was this case, and I don't remember, by, when he sang the message, he could remember it. <laughs> but when he spoke it, he couldn't. <laughs> so, uh, therefore, his right brain was remembering through singing, but his left brain was damaged, right? By something or other. There's now, other examples of that, that <clears throat> some stutterers cannot talk clear, but they can sing clearly. They can sing clearly, you see. Now, therefore, his memory wasn't all gone, you see. Uh, but his memory was impaired very badly, and that kind of impairment of memory prevents your functioning in, in any reasonable way at all. You see, we need memory all, all around to function and to remember what, that we're following some line of action. You see, the verbal side of his memory, see, he constantly kept on saying, I'm conscious for the first time, right? Uh, I never saw you before, I'm conscious for the first time, he said to his wife, right? And, but he must have known you know, in some other level in the right brain that it was not so, right? But see, the right brain was not, was not able to verbalize that, right? So the, uh, uh, therefore his memory was deranged in a very complicated way. Hmm? Uh, he could remember a lot of things, but he couldn't remember how to walk the order of the streets or anything like that. He couldn't. Uh, but when he went to conduct music, he did it well example of Willem de Kooning, who has al- Alzheimer's disease, and he doesn't know who he is, or he doesn't know any of his friends, but he's doing the most beautiful paintings that he, hmm. that he ever did, and they're snatching them up, and you know, they hmm. were painters. Yeah, well, that's another example, yes, that uh, 
you see, uh, memory is a very complex thing, you know, the, uh, so, uh, now, but I think you see that we have to focus on the fact that the possibility of being conscious of self and so on depends very strongly on the kind of intellectual verbal memory that we are talking about now, right? The very possibility of defining the difference between self and some and other, and not all of it, but a great deal of it, right? Hmm. Uh, and experiencing that difference. See, we, we, maybe we would go into it that this probably developed gradually among human beings, you see. Uh, see, it's not clear whether early peoples or animals who are not affected by human beings are that conscious of a se- being separate selves, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, there are clues in the language. You see, I was reading about one clue that it, there are often words having both a physical and a spiritual or mental meaning together, you know, as if they were metaphors. Like the very word spirit means, has a root uh, inspiration like wind or breath, right? Uh, now, some people thought that was a sign that early human beings were very great poets <laughs> and could make a metaphor saying, you know, breath and spirit are the same thing, right? <laughs> But if you look at it another way, you see that's most implausible. <laughs> that more, well, I mean, he analyzed it carefully in a way I can't remember all the details, but <clears throat> the, uh, he said what seems more likely is that in the beginning of perception, people felt the two, they perceived the two as one, right? That breath and what we now call spirit and what we call breath and what we call wind were perceived as different, as, as the same, you know, different ways of parts of the same thing, right? Or different. Right. Hmm. In the Greek language, it is the same word. Right. Nevma yeah. and pneo. Yeah. The same, the same root, the same word. Yes. Anapneo, so that in one of my uh, studying, I felt, I felt what you say now. Yeah. Breath and spirit is yeah, the same. Yeah, it's the same. It's also the same in, in Latin, and it's also the same in Hebrew. You see that breath, uh, wind, and spirit are the same. How is it in Hebrew? Wind and spirit are the same word. You see, ruach. And the uh, uh, so I think it's probably true in many languages. And the uh, but the suggestion is that this was the primary experience that people did not. Ex- it was only later with the intellect that people were able to see that uh, whatever you mean by spirit is one thing, and what you mean by breathing is another. Right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, but in the beginning, people didn't perceive or experience it that way. It's like the case of experiencing, there's no difference between the telephone, sound of the telephone and the telephone and the, and the image, right? <laughs> so uh, you don't experience a difference, you see, between, you have just two different sensations belonging to the same thing, right? Like I say, I see the table and I hear, I see you and I hear you, right? I don't re- separate those two experiences, though they're really very separate in some sense. <laughs> they're very different, right? <laughs> Yet I say they belong to the same thing, right? Hmm? When you're dying, the wind is going out of you, so people could say the spirit. The spirit is going out. But in the early days, they thought there was no difference between spirit and breath. You see, uh, uh, they meant both. They, they meant the, t- the two were one, right? Why did they make that connection? Why? That the two were one. I don't think they made the connection. I think it was made naturally. In the experience itself, and later people separated them when they were more abstract thought. And they probably wouldn't breathe. What's well, clear without the breath, you won't live, and so on. You see, even if you think a little bit in a primitive way, you could would look very reasonable. You see, so yeah, clear. the breath, it's not, it is connected, it's yeah. not separate. Yeah, and you could see that the emotions are connected to the breath, and so on. You see, the inability to breathe it blocks the emotions, and you see, everything would. It would suggest that experience, that way of seeing it. You see now, so the uh, uh, therefore uh, you can now say that the thing has separated by means of abstract thought. People were able to distinguish between breathing and whatever you might mean by spirit. Right? They could say you have a good, great spirit, but uh, your breathing may not be so good. <laughs> you could even have pneumonia and still have a good spirit. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so the uh, 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 and and then later came along come other people who made the metaphor and said, oh, that's a great metaphor. You see, spirit and breath. <laughs> spirit is the same as breath, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so that's the poetic way of seeing it again, right? So from that view, the poetry brings back at a more at our level something of the primitive experience, right? But breathing also. 
also alters, alters their state of consciousness. Yes. You have to ventilate or you hyperventilate, you're going to be... Yeah, so that, all the experience suggests that there's no, no difference between breath and spirit, you see. And, and well, later, by means of abstraction, we have made a difference, right? We therefore experience them as different. <laughs> Spirit ferments in the alcohol. What? Alcohol also changes the spirit. So yeah. It's yeah well, spirit yes. Well, alcohol and spirit is called spirit, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. That's because it evaporates. You see, <laughs> but <laughs> that was a metaphor, I think. You see, but the uh, 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 now, you see, it's it's a very complex business between the metaphoric language, the literal language that developed by abstraction and the original participatory language, you see, where we saw spirit and breath and all that as one, right? Where everything was participating in everything. And now we have to say that this literal language has tremendous advantages because without it we could not have developed technology as we know it, right? But it has tremendous troubles in it, too, because this literal language implicitly claims that it is just telling you the way things are and that it is not affecting anything at all, except that the only thing it's doing is telling you how things are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> kind of like we, we are using more technological language and we've been far away from the poetic language. Yes, that's right. You see, we could say the original language was neither poetic nor literal, but it was participatory and immediate, right? It was the immediate putting together of all the experience, right, as, as perceived. And then came the abstractions of separating them, and then the poetry put them together again. <laughs> uh, the writing and the poetry would be uh, abstract, but the poem would be concrete. That's right. See, the, the poem depends on abstraction to have any value at all, but it, it gives a concrete meaning to the abstraction, you see. Now, the concrete is where it all comes together, you see, that grows together, that's the basic meaning. See, so, the, uh, uh, now, uh, yeah, so you have that, 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 that. now, that, that, then if we come back to it, we say, thought uh, has developed all this, and thought observes, but thought, in the beginning, there was no sense that anybody is doing the observing, probably. It was just observation took place, right? <coughs> Uh, then along came abstraction, which said it is I who am observing, or you, or somebody, you see. Uh, and then came a different experience, right? Hmm? Now, why that abstraction occurred is, well, one can guess only, you see. It was obviously necessary in some sense for people to abstract different themselves and their, uh, everything they did, right? <laughs> hmm? And uh, also, uh, see, once... If you now have a thought and you it's just there, you're thinking about it. But if you attribute it to something outside, then by implication, you're attributing yourself as the thinker who is inside, right? You see, once you attribute the content of a thought to anything objectively and literally, then you imply the thinker as the one who is having that thought, right? Otherwise, there's no explanation for the presence of the thought, right? You see, originally, the thought requires no explanation. It's just simply there. It's just say, its content is all you're conscious of. But then, once you attribute it to something outside, then you require an explanation of where, what is the origin of that thought, do you see? I mean, is that clear what I mean? Yeah. Subject and object, yeah. You see, uh, that, uh, the, uh, you see, even though animals may have intention, and so on, as we have, it's not clear that there has to be an intender who has the intentions. <laughs> yeah, well, to us it's not even clear. You see, is there an intender who has our intentions, you see? <laughs> or is there somebody who feels, uh, you know, we, we, thought can give rise to impulses to act, right? Unconsciously, and we act, right? Hmm? Thought can give rise to intentions, but then we may attribute them to the subject who has them, right? Well, then you give a name to yeah. signify that subject. Yeah. And begin uh, unconsciously to repeat that again and again and again, yeah. which solidifies it. Yes, and then you experience it that way. Now, that may be a useful way to experience it, or even correct in some sense, right? 
but we it's it gets carried too far into large areas where it really muddles things up. See, when we get to if we get into the question of what are we going to do with our thought, which is so incoherent, for example, that's a key question now on which the survival of humanity may depend, right? <laughs> If we try to approach that question without understanding this subject and object, we are going to get all wrong, right? Muddled up. Hmm? Could you be more specific with the subject? I mean, give specific examples, maybe? Well, I think it's at 20 past 12. Maybe we'll start uh, uh, in the afternoon on that point. And that the, uh, uh, but the subject is, you see, is, uh, well, we won't explain that now, but just simply. Hmm? Is it similar to. Uh, form objects through our five senses as necessary as an animal in our environment, which was, say, a million years ago. And now our thinking is also forming an image which we make as real as the image through reality. Yeah. Separate. Yes, well, but fundamentally, uh, all the objects were formed by kind of the pre-verbal thought, you see, by abstraction too, but at another level, right? Because objects, if you imagine in the jungle or somewhere, they... If you just look, you don't see it. And there's no reason to abstract uh, highly defined objects. But you may have a reason for, for practical purpose, or you may find it, inter- you know, you, that uh, you gradually start to abstract objects and name them and so on and experience them, right? Now, it's not clear. Uh, uh, yes, because these objects are clearly abstractions, the fact that they're separate and so on. Yeah. Well, I think we'd better stop now and start up again in the afternoon.